as we gather together in this space to open your word, to join together in song, to listen for your voice in the prayers that we bring. We give thanks that you remind us that we belong together even as we belong to you. As I speak this morning, may there be more of you and less of me in the things that I say. And may that belonging spirit that strangely warmed the heart of Wesley, may that be present to us here today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So folks, this series on belonging is going to help us, I think, to, dis- to remember what it means to be church. Being church together is not about what we do on a Sunday morning. It's not about having your name on the membership role. It's about being united together by the power of the Holy Spirit in ways it's hard to explain, and yet the invitation is there for us to experience. And I want to do so by following the lectionary readings as part of the discipline of the church. And so on today's reading, we have this passage from John 5. It's a passage that's known as a healing passage, but I want to suggest to you that the healing that takes place is not the focus of the story. As is often the case with with gospel narratives, when we find healings and miracles, the stories that come to us uh, feature these particular events, but the way they are framed, they try to teach us something about who God is and about who we are called to be. And so it is with this passage in John 5. There's a man who longs to be healed, but more than that, we find in Jesus bringing the healing that he confronts the way the world thinks about religion, about God, and about healing itself. So let's have a look at this thing. And to help us do that, as for those of us who have journeyed with us over the last 12 months, you'll know that I've often used a method introduced by the philosopher and theologian Paul Ricoeur. When it comes to reading, he says we need to look behind the text, within the text, and in front of the text. This is what biblical scholars call hermeneutics. The word hermeneutics comes from the, the, the God Hermes, the messenger God. It's about how we study the messages we send to each other. And of course, most of us are probably aware that when we're talking to someone, the words that we say are only a part of the message we communicate. The tone that we use, our body language, um, the context in which we are speaking, all of these things convey meaning. So when we come to reading a text, especially one that's as ancient as the biblical text, one that's been translated into different languages, one that was written in a culture so very different to our own, we need to understand the text in in a fuller regard in order to see what the Word might be saying to us. So we're going to use this methodology of behind, within and in front to see what this story might be telling us. So the behind the text basically says to us, we need to look at the context in which the text is written. In this particular case, I, I want to have a, a, a brief look at some of the things that perhaps we read over in this passage and don't realize, realize how important they are. The first is this, that faith has an architecture. What I mean by that is all the things that, um, that engage in our cultural and lived experience tend to be seen in the way that our, our living environment is built and designed. In terms of faith, the way we understand faith is also seen in the, the buildings where we experience our faith, where we worship, um, and in the case of this story, in the city in which this context and in, in this story takes place. So if we look at this building here, we can have a look at how elevated the pulpit is here and realize that for the people who designed this building, the preached word was of such importance that it's, it's up and the, the pulpit is elevated. Um, in England, every, just about every church we went to in, in London, when I was recently there, same architecture um, is supplied. But the difference is, at the front is the altar, where the communion table is, and the, the preaching pulpit is here amongst the people. And the architecture, the design of that is saying that this is where the sacrament takes place, but the Word of God is, is best read among the people and best spoken about amongst the gathered worshipping body. 
In the design of this place, we have stained glass windows all around the church that tell a story, that tell a history. It's not just worshipping spaces. Cities are designed that way. In Washington, D.C., uh, the, the 13 colonies that were um, present at the time that Washington, the capital, was built, monuments are about the 13 colonies all around the city and the design, the, the cityscape is designed around the 13 colonies that were there. Um, Canberra, our capital city, has a, a parliamentary triangle between Parliament House and uh, the, the cap capital, well, the, the civic centre where all the the civilian enterprise happens, and also the, the military centre. So you've got this big triangle, and, and so when um, Walter Burley Griffin put the, the city together, designed the city, he had this in mind. And the idea of that is to bring focus and attention to what the city is meant to be about. So in this particular story, there is mention of five porticos. Now, we just read over that, and we don't quite understand what's going on. And this particular story, this healing takes place on the Sabbath. The architecture of Jerusalem at the time was that it would bring attention to the, to the historical traditions of the Hebrew people. The five porticos, scholars tell us, represent, are meant to represent an architectural design, the five books of the Pentateuch. In other words, the law on which faith is built. So there's a man wanting to be healed and he's sitting in the center of a, an architectural design that focuses on the law of Moses, the law of God. And here is a man wanting to be healed, but it's on the Sabbath. And of course, the law of God says that you can't do any work on the Sabbath. So here in, in the, the center of this architecturally designed space that brings attention to the law of God is a man who requires healing, but that request would mean uh, and the necessity to break the law. And folks, that's what this story is about. The question that comes to us, what are you willing to do to bring healing and hope to another person? Are you willing to break cultural or religious norms in order to do so? That's the power of what this story is. Wesley had his pillars of faith, had his an architectural design in his theology that spoke to him and others about how faith is to be understood. It's called, scholars now refer to it as the Wesleyan quadrilateral. So Wesley said that the four pillars of the Christian faith are tradition, scripture, reason, and experience. And when you put all of these alongside one another, they support what we call the Christian faith. So for Wesley, whenever he came across a decision he didn't quite know how to make, he balanced these four pillars. He said, what does tradition tell me in terms of the church? What does scripture say to me as I, as I open the text? What does reason tell me? And what is my experience? And on Aldersgate Day, we realized the experience that Wesley had suddenly had more importance in his life. Now, we see this in the life of the church. Different ways of experiencing faith in the life of the Christian church are based on different pillars of the Wesleyan quadrilateral. So our Catholic sisters and brothers emphasize tradition, probably more so than they would the others. Our evangelical sisters and brothers probably emphasize scripture more than the others. Our liberal or progressive uh, sisters and brothers probably emphasize reason, and our Pentecostal sisters and brothers will emphasize experience. All four are important, but we all tend to lean more on one than the other. And sometimes it depends on the decision and the context as to which one we will lean on. But Wesley says we need to engage all of them. If we're only focusing on tradition, but we're not looking at the other three, we're going to, the decisions we make will be unbalanced. If we only focus on Scripture, and this might be hard for some of us to hear, if we don't take into consideration tradition or reason or experience, if we only focus on what the Word says, we'll do some pretty crazy things. There's some pretty crazy things in the, written in the Bible if we don't weigh them up with our reason and our experience and the tradition of the church. If we only base things on reason and don't allow Scripture to speak, then we will not confront the reality we have. The, the Beatitudes of Christ say that blessed are the poor. Our reason tells us that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. But we are confronted by this juxtaposition and such that we are 
called to do unreasonable things like loving our enemies because the gospel compels us to do so. And if we only rely on our experience, then we can never um, grow in a sense of challenging our own memories and our, our own context. So all four are very important and we need to balance them out and that's what Wesley encourages us to do. But this story goes further. And so what I want to do now is look at how the story is told. What do we read within the story, the words that are chosen and the way that, that they are written. So the first is this. Whenever you see a number in Scripture, it's an invitation to look a little bit deeper. We're told that this man has been there for 38 years. We're not told how many years Jesus was on the earth. We try and guess that and put, put it together by looking at different dates. But we're not told how old Jesus was when he died. But we know this man has been there for 38 years. When you're given a particular detail like that in Scripture, it's an invitation to look a little bit deeper. That number 38 is only ever mentioned three other times in the Old, in the Old Testament. Uh, twice is to do with the rule of a king. And the third time was about when J Moses wants to enter the Promised Land. He waits, the, we're told in the text, 38 years since the liberation from Egypt before the people of Israel enter into the Promised Land. And the reason is, is that those who were warriors back in the day, those who had to, to use bloodshed, in order to achieve victory, that bloodshed would not be remembered by those who entered into the Promised Land. It's almost a generation. The number 40 is the number for completion and generation. 38, it's almost there. Moses says, we need to wait so that the memory of violence does not come with us into the Promised Land. This man has been there for 38 years, pretty much longer than anyone can remember. And People can't remember the, the day that he first arrived and the reason that he was there. So the waiting is beyond remembrance. But it's not the remembering that is the, that is the moment of significance here. It is what the remembering enters into. And the scripture in Moses about entering into the promised land. Is it possible that this man might be able to enter into a promise that God has? And now we come to the structure of this passage, which... In John's Gospel, as we often find, is written in a chiasm, a particular pattern, where there's a reflection that happens either side. So in, in this particular chiasm, we have the introduction of the term, the multitude. And then we have the, the phrase that the man wants to be healed, and so Jesus says, pick up your mat and walk. And then we have a mention of the Sabbath, which is the focus of this passage. And then we find the man is healed, and so he picks up his mat and walks, and then the, the scripture talks about the crowd. So we have this reflective pattern that focuses us on the point of this story, which is the Sabbath. Now we need to understand, we don't get, quite get the Sabbath. When I was a kid, on Sundays, mum and dad would say, uh, you know, it's a time of rest. You have to go have a lie down. On a Sunday? On Sunday afternoon? I want to go out and kick the footy. I thought Sabbath was a form of punishment. But the whole idea of Sabbath is that it realigns our time. But in Jesus' day, the Sabbath was a law that was sacred. And we need to come to grips with what, what that might mean. The Sabbath law was sacrosanct. It was probably the, one of the most important laws in all of the Torah. And, and here, Jesus heals on the Sabbath. Jesus works on the Sabbath. Jesus breaks this sacred law. You can't get around it. And he does it for a reason. This man is unwell. This man requires healing. This man needs hope and wholeness. And these things, this story tells us, are more important than following the law. If we look through even our modern history, even going back the last 50, 60 years, we can find people who have made such an impact on how we understand ourselves and others because they dared to break a law in order to bring healing and hope. Dr. Martin Luther King, surely someone who broke the law through nonviolent um, nonviolent protests, but it was breaking the law that was able to hold up a mirror to the law that, that said this is unjust. In our own country, 
Aboriginal activists claiming for, for land rights, uh, Eddie Mabo and others who, who took the law on in order to try and bring healing and hope for their people. In more recent times, there's been concern around um, issues around folk on Manus Island and, and Nauru, people imprisoned because they've come to Australia seeking refuge, and people have taken that on to say, we will, ob we will object to that, we'll protest that, because we think the healing and hope of these people incarcerated is more valuable than the law which says they should be detained. So, the question for us, when we look at in front of the text, what does this text mean for us? What happens when the pillars of our faith come into conflict with one another? And I want to suggest to us, if we take faith seriously, the pillars of our faith will always come in conflict with one another. In terms of Christian doctrine, when you look at the doctrine of creation, what the church has said traditionally about creation, and what we understand in terms of reason, in terms of what science says, there's conflict there. How do we resolve that? How do we understand that? The virgin birth might be part of our scriptural tradition, but it defies reason or experience and the resurrection the the whole doctrine of the resurrection is surely the the pillar on which the christian faith um, requires most but how do we understand that it's a very unreasonable concept in terms of how we operate as a church many of us here would have different understandings of prayer different understandings of the holy spirit different understandings of the power of god to heal people and we, we weigh these things up with these four pillars in terms of our social and cultural context. The church in the last 18 months has been divided over the issue of same gender marriage because people have different understandings of tradition and scripture, reason and experience. But we had those same divisions over things like divorce and we continue to have those same divisions over concepts like war. We can't, we can't retreat from these discussions they are paramount to what it means to be a faith that engages the culture and the people of its time. But through all of this, what we discover through the Wesleyan uh, quadrilateral is that apart from these pillars of faith, Wesley experienced a heart strangely warmed. What that means is when we encounter these issues, whatever they might be, we need to realize that for some of them, some people that we're talking to, these issues are much more personal than others. But the heart strangely warmed also reminds us that God is with us in these discussions. So for Zachary and Alexander, a prayer is that they grow up in a church that engages the culture in which they are, does not hide behind barriers, does not put up brick walls, but engages with the culture with a message of love and forgiveness and hope that each culture and each time and day needs to hear. The problem is, most of us have, well, in the traditional church, have what's called a brick wall theology. Rob Bell, an author, has used this analogy quite well. And the problem with the brick wall theology is we, we develop our systems, our, our rules, our methods, our theology, and it's like a, a brick wall. One brick is placed upon the other. And the problem with that is if one brick is challenged, if one brick is moved, the whole thing falls. A brick wall is rigid. It, there's no flexibility. It can't move. And for people who want to join into a community of faith, for people who want to engage in a discussion that, that seems foreign to that faith tradition, there, there's no place for them to belong. So instead, Rob Bell talks about trampoline theology. He says, our belief systems, rather than being bricks in a wall, should be like springs on a trampoline. There are things that are essential, like the, the existence of God and, and the hope of love. These, these are the things that faith is built on, but there's a flexibility there. When a new idea comes along, that there's, a, there's a bit of give. It's not a rigid structure that's going to fall over. There's, there's a bit of bounce. And at the end of the day, bouncing a trampoline is so much more fun than hitting a brick wall. The idea of a trampoline is, is community gathering. Come, let's jump together. Let's see how high we can go. Let's have some fun. Let's see what we can discover about the love of God. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and I'll finish with this, talked about this sort of stuff many years ago at the end of World War II. 
His three pillars were the incarnation, the crucifixion, and the resurrection. And, and the reason why he chose those three pillars is because they're about the person of Jesus Christ. He said, if I, if I want to know what to do in any given situation, I look around and see where is the incarnation of Christ here? Where is the God who loves the poor? Where is the God who, who left the throne room of heaven and was born in a stable to be among us? Where is the God who walks alongside? If I want to know what's happening in any, in any given situation where there's conflict, I ask, where is the crucified one? Who is being crucified for standing up and speaking truth to power, for taking on the mission of God's love, whatever the cost? And if I want to know where hope is, I ask, where is the resurrected one? Where is that hope rising from the ashes? Where is that shoot, green shoot, coming out after the bushfire? Where, where is love winning where no one thought it ever could? So the challenge for us as a church is when we want to engage this idea of faith, can we dare to look beyond the brick walls and invite people to bounce on the trampoline with us? Can we dare to understand that God would strangely warm our hearts if we open our hearts to the lover of all? Can we dare to believe that bringing healing and hope is more important than following rules, whatever the risk that might bring to us? Let's pray. Thank you, God, for the adventure of faith that you call us all to. That our hearts might be strangely warmed, that we might find healing and hope, and that we might bring these things to others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.